Hey, bud. How long are you going to take me? Okay. I mean, I hope you. Yeah. Why don't we mark this out? Yeah. It's dirty, isn't it? Got it clean? Yeah. Right, bud, this is called a marking gauge. You see these little pins? Yeah. Those are really sharp. So what you're gonna do, you're gonna stick it on here and you're gonna slide it forward. There, it's done. Cool, isn't it? Yeah. See, now look, at the end, there's a line all the way up, all the way down. Now why are you making a yarn? This is gonna be called a tenon, so I'm gonna cut <coughs> this out with a saw, and then this will just be left. So all this right here goes away, and this stays here. Pretty cool. Okay, so welcome back into the shop. We are on part two of this table that I'm building for The Chosen. If you haven't seen part one, I would recommend you go check that out first. It's always been tough having the kids in the shop, but I've been trying to just let it happen lately. It's pretty unique that they're able to be around this craft, and when they wander in, I try to get them involved as much as possible. So that's why you saw Johnny there in the beginning. He was helping me lay out these tenons, which right now we're splitting the cheeks off. This is a really cool shot, actually, and you can see this technique only works if the grain cooperates and you're going to see it not cooperate on the next one so basically i've sawed the salt hand saw on the, sh the shoulder of this tenon and then i just come in with a chisel i was i was taught this technique by paul sellers a uh, class i took with him i just come in with a chisel chisel it down as close as you can get to that layout line and uh, then we'll come back you'll see soon and clean it up with a block plane And you see how I stopped there because I'm watching that, that split and it was starting to head down into my layout line. Careful. So here we are, I've got a really cool uh, low angle block plane here by Leap from Knee Loose. And it's, it's a rabbit plane on one side, so the blade goes all the way to the edge of the plane. And it's also skewed, so it's it helps cut the fibers of the wood, especially across the grain. And this is a great example here of how valuable um, marking lines are with, with layout gauges or knives, because you can actually plane down right to the wood fibers as opposed to a line. Um, so it's much more accurate, you know where to stop. And the key to this is just keeping it flat across the whole uh, width of that tenon. You can see I'm checking the flatness here and it is pretty much spot on. I'm gonna flip the board over, basically try to do the exact same technique on this side, but as I mentioned earlier, you're gonna see that this um, isn't gonna cooperate. It's actually gonna split down into the tenon, which, uh, basically means that we can't use this technique. It just won't work. I move it up here, try to take less material, but I'm gonna get a little bit further down here and it's just gonna start to drift down. So I have to opt to use a handsaw, which is just as effective. Uh, this is a great part about this video now is you're seeing a couple different techniques on how to hand cut tenons. Um, basically we're gonna saw just heavy of the line here down to our uh, shoulder and then we'll do the exact same thing with the hand plane to get it all cleaned up. Don't want to pat myself on the back here but I hit it pretty good and lined up perfectly with that other saw curve. I want these to fit relatively loose because we're going to put a wedge on them. Um, they're not, they don't need to be super tight or else it kind of defeats the purpose of this. You could see in that last shot that I had already cut off um, the width of the tenon. So there's a shoulder on the top and bottom, about a quarter of an inch, quarter of an inch that I took off with a handsaw. So I seat those shoulders up and now we're going to mark off uh, the edge of that tenon. It's coming out about three inches. 
Uh, that's going to give us enough room for that top wedge to come down through the tenon. And so we got to mark it to know exactly where to place the mortise for that wedge. Now I'm going to do this by hand. Now this is an incredibly difficult point to drill here because you've got a half inch bit on a one inch tenon. So basically you've got a quarter inch spacing um, to the edge of your tenon, if that makes sense. So if I drift or angle this at all, um, it basically just could ruin the workpiece and become ineffective. So it is absolutely crucial that I drill this as straight as I possibly can, which again, I hate to pat myself on the back, but I, I really did, I, I impressed myself. I did a pretty dang good job. I took it slow and kept my square on it and just, you know, cranked it four or five turns, got off, made sure I was staying on, eyeballed it and made sure I was staying in line. And you'll see here when I flip it over, see I was just feeling there for the tip of that auger bit. I'm gonna take it out of the vise now, flip it over, and you'll see where that tip came through. And it's almost exactly in the middle of that tenon and on the, the layout line that I transferred around. So come back through and take out the rest of that waste. And then I'm gonna do most of the work from here on out with a chisel. Um, it's, it's hard to explain exactly, but this is a tapered, um, not a really a tapered, but an angled mortise. So you have a straight sh straight edge, and then the other opposite opposing edge is going to be tapered to match the taper of the wedge. So you got to just do that by hand, uh, just siding it. So I need to build out the mortise um, to the width of where the taper meets at the bottom, and then come over and start cutting the taper. And that's what I'm doing right now. Is just it's basically a half inch by like a five eighths or three quarter mortise, and then I'll step over and start cutting out the taper. This actually quite a bit of work in this because it's such a wide tenon so you're going down pretty far and you want to make sure again that you're keeping everything straight that mortise has to be really in line um you know if it walks off to the side at all you get a lot of problems so here's what you can see here where i'm kind of angling that edge of that tenon i have a, a line that i've traced on there using the actual wedge and i'm just trying to stick with that line the best i can So this is my final cut here, and you're gonna hear some frustration here because I'm actually gonna mess this up a little bit. And what's gonna happen is I wanna make this cut all the way. I don't want it, I wanna go the full distance with the mallet. And you see, I'm, I'm upset with myself here because I'm not, I didn't take enough material. So the less material, I was just taking a very fine, fine, you know, 30 seconds, maybe a 30 second to a 16th of a material, and the chisel, the, the cutting edge slipped out. And now I've gotta go in there, it's almost impossible to get that started again because it just slides out um, so really what happens now is it's really difficult to make a nice clean cut all the way down that straight that matches that wedge so you get a maximum amount of grab and friction there um, I'm trying now kind of to work it and, and take off the high spots but ideally what you would do is start at the top and make that cut the whole distance slowly go tapping with the mallet so you get a nice clean straight cut the whole way down the chisel slipped out on me and it made it a little bit more difficult to get it exactly how I wanted it. So once I got the mortises cut in each end, I'm gonna shape the end of that tin. Basically you're just gonna make a round over on all four edges using that same skew plane. It also really effective at ingrain, obviously, because it's got that skewed blade and it's low angle. So it cuts real nice. I'm gonna leave the tool marks in this and just kind of let it be as natural as possible. So I do those two long edges and then the two ends I can just hit with a chisel, just kind of hand shape around, round over there. You see me use this chisel a lot. I actually have a video on restoring this chisel. I love wide blade chisels. Um, I just, they're just, I don't know why, I like them a lot. They're super good at doing this, this carving type work. Um, chamfering and things like that on ingrain, but I find them useful in so many different ways. You'll see, you'll notice in my videos that I have this chisel in my hands a lot. I 
Okay, next step is to glue it up. Um, using high glued again, same thing we did on those uprights, just to stay true to um, this kind of old school first century build. These, like I mentioned earlier, need to go in pretty loose because we need that, that wedge to be effective to be able to pull it tight together. I don't put a lot of glue on it because uh, mechanically it's getting locked in place, but it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of glue in there. You can completely leave it dry and you can disassemble. That's one of the advantages of this wedge and this type of joint is it's you can disassemble it. For me, I don't, the way I'm building this table and the way I'm attaching the top, there's no, I, I doubt it's going to get disassembled. And if it, if you really wanted to disassemble it, you could uh, heat up that high glue and um, get it all loose and break it loose. This is the first time I've done one of these wedges, and they are it's amazing how effective they are at pulling that joint tight and locking everything together. So I went through the whole process of building the tabletop without filming much of that. Not super exciting, and I jumped on the machines because I was a little behind. I did do breadboard ends, which um, if you want to see how to do breadboard ends, I have a really good video on that alone. You can check that out. I'll put that link in the description. The entire top of this table is hand planed. I used a scrub plane, so it's got a little bit of shape to the blade, so it's putting some texture in that tabletop. Getting some tear out in some places, uh, just kind of adding a lot of character to it. Try, you know, obviously, a tabletop in the first century would have been hand planed, so I wanted to kind of match that vibe and that feel. It's a three board top. This is not glued up. Each board independently floats in a tongue and groove with the breadboard end locking each board together as well. So there's room for movement. So what I decided to do is I got some old uh, cut nails and I thought I'd just nail in the center of each board down into my upright and that's how I would attach the tabletop. I'm assuming that's how it would have been attached um, you know, in the first century. I, I, they didn't have screws, they had nails. So um, that's why I'm going this route. And surprisingly, I was worried because, you know, you could lift up really hard on this and maybe pull it loose, but those nails really grabbed, and I don't think this thing's coming loose. So this last little technique was just kind of an afterthought, honestly. I wanted to have that kind of hand-hewn look on the edge of the boards because, you know, that's how they would have shaped timber back in the days. I had planes to smooth that out, but um, to achieve that, I thought, well, I'll just grab that wide chisel and try to do it with that and it actually worked really well surprisingly just a couple taps cutting down into the wood and then bend the chisel over and pop you know split out a little section and just go down the length of the table it's a really cool uh interesting look and to me it looks really authentic and just fits the the style of the table And you can also see, look, looking down on it, how it kind of follows the, the shape of the grain. So it kind of gives a little bit of um, organic feel to the edge of that board. It's not perfectly straight. As you split these out, they're kind of going with the, with the grain, obviously, because you're splitting it. So it has that kind of look to it. When I term I just ended it right there at that breadboard and popped it out. And, um, you know, it's pretty rough now, so I, I decided to come back with a draw knife, just try to split off any loose fibers, kind of clean it down a little bit, just leave those chisel cuts. Uh, obviously, I don't want to take those out. And then I took the draw knife and put a, you know, tried to ease the edges with a chamfer, a hand cut chamfer on there. Really just, I think, pretty solid, cool look uh, for the top of that table. Okay, so I just sealed it with a couple coats of uh, armor seal. That, uh, after talking to James, the set director, he decided and thought he might want to age it and stain it a little bit. So the best thing to do was to seal it first so we didn't get this nasty, dark, blotchy table. Uh, so two coats of armor seal did the job. Okay, so that's going to close it down for most for the build part of this. Um, all in all, I spent about four days on this project. 
uh, maybe a little bit more than that. I did most mostly all of it was done by hand with exception to the tabletop, which I cut the tongue and groove on the table saw and milled all those boards out with machines. And I did a lot of the breadboard ends with machines just to play catch up because I was getting behind uh, and needed to get back to uh, actual customers, customer orders. All in all, I love this build and it was fun to dive into the hand tools and I feel like I learned a lot and just fully enjoyed it. Okay, check it out guys. It's been a long day of driving. Uh, I'm pretty worn out, but we just got the table here. This is the set it's gonna be, and this is so freaking cool. These guys designed and made all of this, and the table's sitting right here. I think they're gonna do a little aging to it, try to put some stain on it, so it'll be interesting to see when I come back how this looks. I've never been on a TV set, so it's really cool to see. I'll be back on Monday to watch them shoot this scene, so guys, stay tuned real soon. We're gonna get to see the action happen. Okay, so we dropped the table off on Friday, and I had the opportunity to kind of scope out the set, see the scene, see uh, a couple other things. Let me tell you, the amount of thought and detail uh, and just pure skill and talent that goes into designing these sets is pretty amazing. You just walk into this um, framed out box and it's like you've walked back into the first century. They had real, I mean, they had dead fish hanging from the ceiling. Uh, it was just authentic painting. Everything was really, really well done. I was super impressed with it. They actually shoot, um, they actually work all night. It's pretty amazing. We showed up uh, at seven and I think they shot till six in the morning. We didn't stay that long. I would have stayed all night, but I couldn't drag Emily through that. She gets pretty tired. So we didn't last um, super long, but we had an opportunity to uh, meet the director, Dallas Jenkins. Also, we got to meet Liz Tabish, who plays Mary Magdalene in this particular scene. She's kind of the focus of the scene. I will tell you that being on a TV set, uh, there's a lot going on. It's super hectic. And it's pretty amazing to me how many, how much work goes into getting shots. Like I would watch them rehearse and then get like five seconds of a, of a scene and then change camera positions, do the same thing, do it over and over for like an hour and then move on to the next section of that scene. So as a YouTube content creator, it's nothing like that for me. It's just get the shot, move to the next one, move to the next one. They put a lot of um, effort into getting every detail right, every part of the composition um, of the frame and everything. You know, I could. I was standing behind the monitors and I could watch the uh, director of cinematography in Dallas kind of throw back and forth things they liked and didn't like. It was just really cool to observe and watch uh, people who are very talented at their trade uh, work together. So it was an awesome experience. Uh, so let's check out that footage right now. Okay, so behind me is the actual set that they are using for my table. We're gonna get to go in there real soon and check it out. This is crazy, man. There's a lot going on on the TV set. A whole lot of people, just a lot happening. So uh, hopefully they go in there and get some cool footage. You can see they have made it look much older. That's super exciting. They're setting up to shoot. Pretty awesome to see the table all set and ready to go. Hold on to it. Okay, so that closes it down for this video. What an awesome opportunity to get to build this table. I just am so pumped that I got to be a part of it all. Hopefully, maybe somewhere down the road. I mean, I think they're doing seven episodes, so possibly there could be another table in there. Maybe The Last Supper. I don't know. I want to say thanks to all the people who let us come down and do that. Daryl Eves uh, for getting the ball rolling and making the connections. Really appreciate that. Dallas Jenkins for taking the time to talk with us on set. He actually stopped production 
brought us into the set and took a photo with Emily and I in front of the table. So cool. Super nice guy. Also very tall. I had no idea how tall he was. Also a big thanks to Julie Molina who is was kind of our point of contact for this whole thing. She was the one who got was able for starters I was the only one who's going to build on be all on set because of COVID. They're very strict with COVID. She managed to get Emily on set with me which is amazing because she really wanted to go. She helped just arrange everything. She helped us get COVID tested. She did a just a lot of legwork to get me on set. So I really appreciate everything you did, Julie. You were pretty awesome. We had a great time hanging out with you and uh, learning more about The Chosen. So thank you. The biggest thanks though has to go to my wife, Emily, who somehow always eludes the camera. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, that might be my fault. I don't know. I get a little bit nervous when I have people around me and have a camera, but she is incredible and awesome. And I'm so thankful that she comes along on these journeys with me and supports me. And I just want to say thanks to Emily, my awesome and beautiful wife. Now, before we shut it down, there is some talk of this table possibly getting auctioned off. It's still kind of tossed around the idea. Um, so if that happens, um, those proceeds would support The Chosen, and it would also be an opportunity for you to get a really cool table. I'll keep you guys in the loop. If y'all are interested in that, you should leave a comment let me know. If the interest is there, then it's definitely more likely to happen. And the final thanks obviously goes to you guys for watching these videos, supporting me. Just a huge thanks to y'all. There is some really cool stuff coming our way. I'm about to start the Alamo video, which is going to be really exciting. And there's just a lot going on this year. So uh, stay tuned. Big thanks. I'll see you guys next time.